anything, I'm absolutely humbled by your knowledge, your dedication, and your achievements. Some of the young people we've heard today are just outstanding, awesome, as the Americans would say, I think. Um, as I'm the first to speak, though, I'm going to, and I've been involved with intellectual preneurs and think tanks for most of my life, I'm going to tell you a little bit of history about think tanks, from which I think one, one, can, one can draw some, some conclusions. And my father and his younger brother were brought up by their mother, their father having been killed in the First World War, along with nearly all their uncles. When the Second World War started, they immediately joined the British Air Force, as they already had their pilot's license. And early on in the Battle of Britain, my uncle's plane was shot down in front of my father, his brother dying in flames as he fell from his parachute. My father felt he died, they had died to give freedom to others, but after the war, freedom was being fast eroded in a socialist Britain, and he could see that the communist threat would rival that of the Nazis that had just been defeated. Um, he began to look for solutions. Then he read Hayek's Road to Serfdom in a condensed version in the Reader's Digest, and he was inspired. He went and found Hayek in the London School of Economics and asked him what to do, suggesting perhaps politics, only to be told by Hayek that society's course will only be changed by a change in ideas. First, you must reach the intellectuals, the teachers and writers with reasoned argument. It will be their influence on society that will prevail and politicians will follow. So the challenge was set and some nine years later in 1955, after establishing a successful business that would enable him to realize his dream, the trustees of the Institute of Economic Affairs were signed, known as the IEA in London. It was one of the first think tanks, possibly the first in the world, to promote the freedom of the individual and limited government. By a mixture of good judgment and good luck, the think tank was founded on a set of principles that really have withstood the test of time. It is completely independent of party politics, and one cannot stress the importance of this more strongly enough. Party politics always involve compromise at some point, and compromise and principle are a very bad mix if you want credibility. It was to be founded by many, funded by many sources, so never reliant on one or a few big donors, and so susceptible to being persuaded to take a certain point of view, and it was never to accept government funding for that reason. Funding a think tank, as most of you will know, is a continual challenge. Like a hungry child, a think tank is never satisfied. The IEA was no exception, and to this day, funding is still probably the biggest challenge. Um, another strength is it, its market-based solutions to social and economic problems have always been based on the research work of academics, and the publications were peer-reviewed, so they acquired the credibility of academic papers. This encouraged academics to work for the IEA for nothing, which always surprises me, because although we preach market economics, we don't often practice them in the think tank world in this respect. The finding of the IEA's authors were published and still are in short, simple booklets without jargon that are easily understood by laymen and especially the press. This was helpful in persuading the press to review them or cover the papers in their op-eds, etc. Although to begin with, it was almost impossible to get any coverage at all. Then some management decisions turned out rather well. Ralph Harris, who was chosen as the first director general, was a natural. He had been an academic and journalist, and my father had heard him speak years before and had mentioned his dream to him. Years later, when we were going through some IEA papers, which we had stored in our home, we found a letter from my father in 1956 to one of his colleagues. It said, if only we could find $700 a year or so, we could get Ralph Harris from Scotland to come and run the think tank. And they must have found the $700 because he came and ran it. But it does show what's happened to money in between. He was a great character, totally committed to freedom, intelligent, jokey, easygoing, um, wrote very well. And, but he picked an editor, Arthur Selden, who was totally different. He wasn't charismatic and he had the most terrible stutter, but he was a brilliant and somewhat ruthless editor who persisted until the arguments were unequivocal and totally clear and easy to understand. I know. I wrote some papers for the IEA on agriculture when I was in my mid and late 20s 
and I can remember that Arthur returned the first one to me no less than seven times until he was satisfied with it. I was not so amused at the time, but I have been grateful ever since. Um, both Ro Ralph and Arthur came from very poor backgrounds, which was also a strength for the IEA, particularly at that time. No one could say that it was easy for them to make the case for the market, because they had never known hardship. On the contrary, they had both known poverty for all of their young lives, and made the case for the market on the basis that it was the only system that gave poor people like them the chance to better themselves through their own efforts. The early years of the IEA were far from easy. The taunt from the opponents was that the IEA had had the only two remaining free market economists in the UK. Norman Rouquet, a wonderful economist and writer, wrote in The Economist in 1984, a lot later. I remember writing a polite review of the first publication of the IEA in the early 60s, but saying privately the venture would fail. And, and that only a fool would write the second paper. And then I proceeded to write the second paper myself. So it was beginning to catch on. Um, the first paper was interesting, and it taught us all a big lesson, um, particularly my father, who liked things to be a bit more lively. Um, and it wasn't what he, he thought it was a boring book about the evils of resale price maintenance, and that it wouldn't get anything to change and nobody would read it. Um, resale price maintenance enabled manufacturers to require all retailers to sell their product at the manufacturer's required price, so there was no competition. You can't really imagine it now, can you? That if you bought a Mars bar or a Kit Kat or something, whatever you bought, wherever you bought it in the UK, it would be the same price. Um, you can imagine what it did to the economy, but it was fiercely resisted. One of the reasons for the success of the publication was the figure that the IEA have found was that Britons were paying 180 million more for their purchases than was necessary. According to my calculations, which should never be trusted because I'm a lousy mathematician, that would have been $3.5 billion in today's terms. So they showed what a huge change benefit this would be for most people if you could change this one seemingly innocuous little piece of legislation. And it was really a big success and the legislation was changed. Um, but generally, it was not until the mid-70s that the IEA's views began to be treated more seriously. That was 20 years after it was first set up. So you who are starting out, just remember that. 20 years of being treated as idiots. Um, <laughs> patience is much needed, um, and you've all, so most of you have got time. At this time, the UK economy had been brought to its knees by socialist policies. Uh, there were three-day weeks, union troubles. Um, and um, the, uh, at last the British public were ready for a change, and the IEA had the papers ready. A politician called Sir Keith Joseph been an admirer of the publications, and he introduced them to a young lady called Margaret Thatcher. The rest, as they say, is history. After her election, Mrs Thatcher wrote to the IEA and my father saying, um, the IEA created the climate of opinion which made our victory possible. People now started arriving at my father's door to ask them how to repeat the process, and eventually the demand came so big that he set up the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. In between that and having just lost most of his money, he set up the Manhattan Institute in New York and the Pacific Institute in San Francisco, for any of you who are American here, both now still well-respected and effective. Many of you will know Atlas, which is in the business of helping intellectual entrepreneurs set up think tanks and promote the vision of a free and responsible society. And I'm sure many of you will have interacted with them. Um, the, indeed, the Association for Liberal Thinking runs one of their free enterprise training centers, which is why we're here today. So from all those years back, the, I, my father's ideas and action have, is still changing the world. I should add here that he went to his first MPS meeting in the early 1950s, and as with so many others, it had a huge influence on him. Without Hayek and the MPS, the IEA would never have happened, and so, uh, so much else would not have happened either. So my message is that one, with patience and determination, one person, each of you, can make a big difference. Two, ideas do have consequences. We're in the business of ideas, and they can change the world. Three, an independent think tank is a really effective way of changing public opinion in favor of the creative power of freedom 
which can alone deliver prosperity and peace. Good luck to you all in your efforts.